So this is kind of perfect that I am talking about community. They didn't specifically ask me to talk about community. Um, a different conference that I was a part of did. But seeing the shirts and then Kristen's message and the verse, I'm actually going to read that verse that Amanda read this morning. So God has this message for you. Um, this is just such a sweet time. I, how many of you have been here before? I am, so a couple people have said, you came all the way from New Jersey for this. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm one of the speakers, but the reality is that this is worth flying across the country <laughs> for. Because this is as good as it gets. Um, the way that this has been put on, first of all, Kristen is worth traveling anywhere to hear. Um, but just this time is so sweet. So I am so glad that you're here. I know that you could be napping right now or doing something that would be more enjoyable probably, but I appreciate your heart to be here. So, so I'm talking about community today. How many of you feel like you have a great community? Okay, well this is essentially two or three talks rushed into one. So if a lot of people felt like they had community, I was going to skip a part, but I'm not going to do that. So I need you to bear with me because I would love to talk really slowly and give lots of examples, and, but I have a lot to throw at you. So I'm going to throw a lot of content at you, um, but I, this is an important message. This is an important message for ladies, for Christians. We all need to be living this life together, but for foster and adoptive moms, like Kristen already set the foundation for, we need each other. We need each other in a unique way. Um, but I want to lay a foundation just from scripture real quick before we move on to how to get community and what it looks like to live in community. I just want to set a foundation from scripture. So we're going to start with Mark 12, 30 through 31. And you know this story. A Pharisee is trying to trip up Jesus. And so he comes to Jesus, like, okay, I'm going to ask you a lose-lose question. What is the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus' answer to him is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. The reality is that God says that following him means loving others. This is as basic a truth as we get. So we often talk about wanting to follow God's calling on our lives. What is God calling us to? And we can sort of over-spiritualize this idea, but God is very clear and very simple in what he calls us to. He's calling us to love him and to love others. It's that simple. You want to know what God is calling you to? It's that. And I never feel more like I'm preaching to the choir than when I'm talking to a bunch of foster and adoptive moms. Because you guys know love. You guys do love all day, every day. This is sacrificial love is what your days look like. But if you're anything like me, you could pour out your life for this child in your home and weep for them and sacrifice everything for them and then show up at support group and, oh my goodness, I can't believe that woman said that. Oh, I can't. And all of a sudden, this, I want to love like Jesus, I want to love sacrificially, has a limit. And the people around us can sometimes be harder to love than even these kids that we have a heart to love already. So, God calls us to love. And it's that simple. Another just biblical truth to, to set the foundation here is that he created us to need each other. So we were not made to do this on your own. God created you. He created you with this need for other people. It is in your DNA to need other people. So if you're here and you're struggling and you're thinking, I can't do this for another day, this mom thing, this adoptive mom thing, this foster mom thing, I can't do it anymore. If you're doing it on your own, then you're right. You can't do it anymore. You cannot do this on your own because you weren't created with the ability to do it on your own. He wants us to do this life together. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 
says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls down and has no one to help them up. So I have two kids who fall a lot. One is a klutz. She just falls constantly, but she pops right back up. It's just a little trip. That's not what this is talking about. I have another child who falls because he climbs, because he's like a monkey. <laughs> and so he climbs onto the couch, and he will get lodged behind the couch, face forward, just down, and he will be screaming in desperation, I need you to get me up. <laughs> That's the kind of falling we're talking about. Pity the one who gets stuck. We're talking about a desperate, I can't get up on my own, I can't do this, I need someone to pick me up right now. And that's the reality for so many of us. This verse assumes that you're gonna fall. It assumes that you're gonna need others to pick you up. So, you are at a conference with 125 other foster and adoptive moms. I don't think you need so much convincing. I think that you know this. We know that we need each other. We feel it. We feel the symptoms of confusion and exhaustion and loneliness. We experience those symptoms and we know that we need each other. So we need to live in community. And I know that's sort of a Christianese word, community. But when I say community, I mean living in relationship and partnership. So when we're living in community with other foster and adoptive moms, it's relationship and partnership. We know what relationship is. We know how sweet it is. It's laughing and crying together. It's not feeling like you're crazy when you're the one experiencing this and someone else is too. It's having people to do this together, the camaraderie. It's the friendships. Relationship is the easy part because we all know that we need that. Then there's the partnership. So partnership is what we bring and we receive with others. So what we bring to other people and what we receive from them. And the idea that we can do more and better together than we can do alone. So we can do more together and we can do better together than we could ever do on our own. So this is the service, the way we serve each other that empowers us to be able to get through the day, that empowers us to be able to bring more children into our home. It's the information we share with each other so that we can know better and we can do better for our kids. It's the emotional strength we bring to each other. It's the prayers that we pray for each other that actually change situations and actually give us strength that we didn't have beforehand. When we live in relationship and partnership, we are living the way that God wants us to. And we're accessing all that he has for us. So, if you don't feel like you have a great community, I don't want to talk too much about this thing that you need, that every person needs and you must have, and you're feeling like, but I don't have this. So we're going to go through some really practical ways of what it looks like to try to find community, to try to create community. So here are my thoughts. It's use it, create it, join it, force it, and Google it. <laughs> so the first idea is that you want to use the community that you already have. And the idea here is that you take advantage of the people who are already in your life, who already care about you, who already love you and know you. There are a lot of people who don't understand. A lot of people in your life who can't understand. But they can try to understand and they can be understanding. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overcome you except what is common to man. And here's the thing. We're all struggling in one way or another. Some of our struggles are really unique as foster and adoptive moms. But the reality is everyone's struggling. Everyone is struggling. Life is hard for everyone. And so we can come to that friend who doesn't understand what it's like to have a child with PTSD, but she understands what it's like to have a child with ADD. And maybe we can find some common ground on how we seek to have compassion on our children. Or maybe you are struggling with your child's biological mom. <coughs> your friends don't understand what that means, but they struggle with their mother-in-law. They know what it's like to have someone in their life 
that they have a hard time loving. So the people who are already in your life and already care about you, let them care for you, let them um, be there with you, even if they're not completely understanding what it is you're going through. When I first got married and had a baby, I was the first of my group of friends. And so I was like, well, I better go find some mom friends. And while there was some reality in that and I needed that, I also found that the women who already knew me and already loved me, they could love me because they knew me and they knew God's word. So they could still care for me even if there wasn't understanding. So don't create a line in the sand. Don't create a line that says, I am a foster and adoptive mom. You couldn't possibly understand. Let the people who already care about you care for you. When I first became a foster mom, I thought there was this honorable sort of mama bear idea of this child is my child and you will treat them as my child or else. All right. So are there any runners in this room? If you come on this retreat and you went running, then you are a runner. So there's all this talk about how we're all together and you're my people. And if you are a runner, you are not my people. <laughs> like not even, I don't understand you. It is not the way that I'm bent. Um, and really, I've always been like this. But I would say maybe six months ago, I decided, okay, it's not too late for me. I'm only 30-something. Like, I can turn this thing around. I want to become a runner. So I got this uh, Couch to 5K app, and I was like, this is made for someone like me. This is perfect for me. I was ready. I have one pair of sneakers that I've had my entire life. And so I, I put on my iPod, I used the app, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. So day one, I think it's like you run for a minute and a half and you walk for a minute and a half, and you just reverse that. So I would spend the first minute and a half running, feeling like, I'm gonna die. I'm legitimately gonna pass out. I can't breathe, this is terrible. And then I would spend the next minute and a half going like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to run again soon. <laughs> I can't do this. So, but I didn't want to give up. So I did day one of this Couch to 5K for two weeks before I finally said, you know what, this is just not my thing and it's never going to be my thing. And I flat out gave up and I have not jogged anywhere since. And really I've always been like this. I, I didn't even like to walk. When I met my best friend, she would talk about going on a walk and I was like, well, where are we walking? I don't understand. Well, we're just gonna walk around. So she would <laughs> convince me to do it because the boy I liked lived in her neighborhood. So I was okay if there was a destination. If we were going somewhere, if we were gonna walk past this boy's house, then I was in for the walk. That boy is actually my husband. So <laughs> it worked. <laughs> But I needed a destination. The idea of just doing this, an exercise, with no purpose to it, I just couldn't even comprehend it. Well, running is a very biblical concept. Paul talks about running a lot. In Galatians, he talks about running well. In Philippians, he talks about not running in vain. At the end of his life, in 2 Timothy 4, he says, I finished the race. In 1 Corinthians 9, running in such a way as to win the prize, the prize that will last forever. And I love this analogy. Even though I'm not a runner, even though I don't get it, I love it. It's perfect for me because, you know what, this life, it's hard, it's exhausting, it feels pointless, it is a difficult thing. And I need to be reminded of my destination. I need to remember what the point of all this is, or else it's too hard for me to do it. So all at once, this is for you runners, and it's for people like me who don't run, because we all get this concept of how difficult it is and the prize that we're running for. 
So, I got really excited about this running metaphor. I don't run, picture me as the girl with like the t-shirt and handing the cup of water and holding up the sign, ready, I found a quote even. There's no doubt about it, it's from womensrunning.com. I can promise you this is the first time I've ever been on womensrunning.com. But I got us a quote. There's no doubt about it, the true unsung heroes of race day are the spectators. Good race or bad race, an inspirational spectator sign is nothing short of a blessing. When your quads are screaming and you're ready to fall over from exhaustion, a good spectator sign isn't just a distraction, it's a lifeline. So picture me, you are a strong minute and a half into your run and you wanna die if you're me. <laughs> picture me on the sidelines throwing up signs for you, reminding you of your destination, inspiring you for the race. And I'm just gonna remind you of what we're running towards. That talk, I think, was enough to build anyone's faith for this journey. I feel so ill-equipped to even share this now. But God wants to remind us of what we're doing all this for. So here are these signs. Be reminded, be encouraged of this race and the prize. So the first is one day we are going to see God face to face, and it's all going to make sense. 1 Corinthians 13 says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Has anyone else spent the majority of their time as a foster and adoptive parent feeling confused, full of questions, wondering if you're doing it the right way, what's going on? I had one point in my parenting career where I felt like I had it together and I knew what I was doing. And I had one daughter and she was six months old <laughs> and she slept through the night and I was like, this is easy, this is great, I got this. And now I wish that that arrogant mom could come and like tell me what to do <laughs> because most of the time I'm confused and I don't know what's going on and I have questions. But I love that this verse is part of 1 Corinthians 13. That's the love chapter. And yet this verse is here. And I love that God is speaking to us that when we love people, there are going to be questions attached to our love for them. There are going to be questions that plague our hearts, questions that are deep and heavy on our hearts. So foster parents, here are some of my questions, maybe they mirror yours. Whatever happened to that child who was in my home and who left? A child that you worried about every bump and every rash and every bite of food that they ate, and then they're just gone and you never see them again. Whatever happened to that child? After rights have been terminated, did I do enough? Did I do my part to support reunification? Did I do everything I could to help mom, or did I love this child so much that I was blinded by that? Why would God bring a child into my home, one that I loved, one that I was willing to adopt, only to have her move to be with a sibling and bounce from house to house to house for years, where now they're saying she can't even be in a home? Why would these things happen? These things plague my heart sometimes. Adoptive parents, these are questions that I've heard from my friends who've adopted, especially internationally. Who are my child's biological parents? Did they give up my child just because they didn't have the resources, because there was poverty? Why did God allow the child that we were in the process of adopting to die in their orphanage alone when we were about to bring them home to be with us? Why would God place a child in my family who doesn't want to be in my family? Who doesn't want to be a part of any family? Why would God do that? And these are questions that we don't sort of just happily ponder. They're questions that can really plague us. But friends, they're questions that one day we'll be able to ask God face to face. We will see him and we will ask him and we will know fully. You will understand. 
I had a debilitating illness when I was a teenager. And my mom was just crying out to God, like, God, why would you let this happen? And she let God gave her a picture of this tapestry. And, you know, tapestry, tapestry is supposed to be beautiful. And all she could see were these messy threads hanging and nothing made sense and the picture wasn't pretty and everything was torn. And she was asking God, what are you doing here? She felt like God spoke to her, I'm weaving a picture. I'm weaving something beautiful that you can't see right now. You see the underneath and you're not supposed to be able to see it. But one day you are gonna see the flip side of it, the beautiful picture that I was creating. God right now is weaving our stories, our children's stories, their biological family stories, the people in our community, in our churches. God is weaving something right now that we don't understand, but one day we're going to be with him, and we're going to see it. We're going to see that beautiful picture, and we're going to understand it. My second sign for you as you're running, if you want to give up. This world is passing away. 1 John 2.17 says, The world and all its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And there are two main things that we can take from this. One is take heart because this world is passing away. We know brokenness. We know it more than some others know it. We have seen things that our children have gone through. We've read the reports, we've seen the injuries, we've seen the trauma that they have now. We understand how broken this world is. But if we have saving faith in Jesus, and if our children come to saving faith in Jesus, that brokenness, the suffering of this world, everything that is sad and hard and painful, it won't last. It's passing away. Revelation 21, four says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Has anyone cried over your children? Maybe today. Are your children crying tears of emotional pain with questions, physical pain? One day, God himself will wipe those tears away. God himself will wipe your tears away. The world as we know it is passing away. All the sadness and the brokenness of it is passing away. And another little point to think about through this, we talk about this term forever home. I use it, it's a beautiful term, especially for our kids who bounce around. We bring our kids into our home, forever home. But really, it's not an accurate term because nothing on this earth is forever. So when our children are craving for their original home, we need to sit in that space with them and let them mourn and be understanding and have compassion. But if they come to know Jesus, we can help them see that that craving for home was placed in them by God and it's for a better home. The Bible says that we long for a better home, a heavenly country. So when they have those cravings, we can say, yes, God placed that in you. But it's not just for your first home. It's not just for your country of origin. That craving will one day be fulfilled in heaven with Jesus in the home that he created for you. You will finally feel completely at home. So this world is passing away. The hard things are passing away. The sad things are passing away. But also this verse says its desires are passing away. So it's not just the suffering. It's the happy things, the desires of this world. We remember the hope of heaven. We're freed from thinking that all of this is all there is. And what that does is it allows us to experience the cost of being a foster and adoptive parent and have those costs in the right perspective. Anyone experience any costs as a foster adoptive parent? What about literal costs? <laughs> Anyone spend forty, fifty thousand dollars to bring your child home? Literal costs. Matthew six nine 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Every cent that you have spent on the mission of orphan care is being stored up for you in heaven. I love Randy Alcorn. He talks about, yeah, you can use up your money here, you can save it up here, or you can send it on ahead. If you've spent actual costs, God is storing that up for you in heaven. What about other costs? Freedom. We've gone through times where we can't really be in public because our children's behaviors are so severe, where some of our kids can't participate in the activities they want to participate in because we just have lost so much freedom with our kids' needs. Time, besides just the time of parenting a child, the time that I've spent driving to appointments and having workers in my home and all the chores of foster care, personal energy and rest. I had a baby in my home this summer who was on a monitor. Has anyone had a kid on an apnea monitor? Yes. Oh. They are loud, and they go off a lot. This little girl, her monitor went off 30 times a night, and it's meant to wake you up. So I was operating on a strong, like, three hours of sleep every night and caring for six kids during the day. I gave up a lot of energy and rest. There was a cost involved in that. Relationships. In case you're wondering, people don't really like to invite you over for dinner if you have six kids. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. <laughs> Maybe you have a child who other people don't feel comfortable with their children being with your children. Maybe there are costs in family members who don't understand this journey that you're on, who haven't accepted your children the way that you would help them to. There are costs. Ease. We've had times in our life where everything is hard, where we go to church and I'm like, we're supposed to go to church to encounter God, but when I'm at church, I'm just angry and sad <laughs> because this is so hard. Why is everything so hard? We give up ease. There are so many costs. We give up a lot for our kids, but when we realize that these things, ease and freedom and relationships even, when they're passing away, it comes into the right perspective where we see what really matters, what's lasting forever, for eternity, and those other things, they're passing away. My next sign for you. Your work as a foster and adoptive parent echoes into eternity. And Kristen started this weekend with this, that God sees you. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Sometimes what we see just doesn't make sense, and it doesn't feel worth it. What we give, those costs, and then we see what we get and what happens to these children's cases or how much our kids struggle, sometimes it just doesn't feel worth it. And foster parents, I want a quick aside for us. This verse is real for us. We understand temporary better than most. Temporary touches our lives in a very profound way. So I think that this can be challenging because we give so much, and if we fix our eyes on what is seen, we're giving a lot, and it's, for what? What was the point of that? When we see the temporary, it may not feel like it's worth it, but this isn't all there is. The day-to-day, -day, what you do day-to-day -day as a mom, isn't it. There's a whole other realm that's unseen. God's purposes for your family, for your children, for entire families, for their histories, their trajectories to be completely rewritten, for waves of compassion to flow out of our homes and into our communities. God is doing things that you don't see, that can be hard to see. So 
it seems almost counterintuitive. We're told to focus on not what is seen, what our eyes actually see, but what is unseen. We fix our eyes on the real stuff. We see these things that are passing away, but God says the real things are what we can't even see, but we're told to fix our eyes on it. But here's what we're told to fix our eyes on. What's achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we're not just talking about God's glory here. God is talking about our glory. And this leads to my next sign, which is that God sees it all. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you helped his people and continue to help him. The Bible talks about our inheritance, our crowns, our eternal glory, the commendation we'll receive. God doesn't just tell us these things and then say, but I don't want you to be motivated by them. I want you to just be motivated out of love for me. God tells us these things because he wants us to remember them. He wants us to be motivated by them. If you tell your kids, you know, if you have a great day at school, I'm going to take you out to ice cream afterwards. You're saying, I love you. I want to reward you if you do this. You don't resent them for being motivated by that. God promises us rewards because he wants us to remember and be motivated by rewards. Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. God is talking about how to please him here, and there's two simple truths. One is as simple as you get. It's that he exists. But the other is that he rewards. God wants us to believe that so deeply that he says, if you want to please me, this is what you need to believe about me, that I reward you need to know it, and you need to believe it. Your love for your children, your service to their biological families, all the prayers and the energy that you give to the kids in your home, God sees it, and he promises to reward it. I uh, spoke this to a group of men and women a couple of weeks ago, and I had to say, like, okay, dads, you're great. Like, Go on and on about the dads. But moms, you are awesome. And so much of what you do is unseen. So much of what you do are those little things that no one notices, no one appreciates, no one thanks you for. And part of me wants to say, I wish that I could just be in the corner of your room and say, I see that. I saw that your child just told you that they hate you. And you looked at them with love and said, I love you. Or you tripped over the toys that you told them to pick up and you didn't get angry. That is a miracle. <laughs> when those things happen, those are miracles. All these little moments that people only realize when you don't do them. You know what I'm talking about? Like when the chores aren't done, that's the only time people realize. But also these deeper moments of being a foster and adoptive parent. When you don't resent the biological parent, when you don't get angry at your worker. God sees those things. I don't need to be in the corner saying, I saw that, I saw that, because the audience of one, God sees it and he <coughs> celebrates it. He rejoices, he honors it, he is the one who's there seeing it. I told you that I always quote myself, so bear with me. This was my prayer as a mom when I just felt unappreciated and I felt like so much of what I did wasn't important because it wasn't noticed. I'm thankful that knowing Jesus makes my seemingly meaningless days meaningful. That the small acts that no one thanks or notices or appreciates, God sees and celebrates. That God is not unjust so as to overlook my work. That what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I am thankful that every word I speak, every dish I scrub, every diaper I change, every spill I clean that's done out of love for my Savior is divinely transformed from a mom's chore into a daughter's worship. 
I'm thankful that the menial, menial, outwardly worthless moments of my day have purpose and echo into eternity. My last sign, heaven is real. We are here, we are bogged down by all that we have on our plates, all that we have in our hands. And it's so hard for us to see and remember. Heaven is a real place, with a real city, with real dimensions, the real person of Jesus, and our real Heavenly Father. There's a lot that we don't know about heaven, and so it can be really abstract for us to think about it, for us to just spend time thinking about this place that we were created for, this place we're going to spend all of eternity. So if I'm talking about this destination and it doesn't feel real to you, it doesn't feel exciting to you, study God's word. If it feels intimidating, there's a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn that I encourage you to read. He has another book called In Light of Eternity, which is a shorter one. Uh, also read fiction that excites you about heaven. So C.S. Lewis, I'm, go I'm a homeschool mom. I'm going through the Chronicles of Narnia with my daughter, and I'm just like crying all the time. She's like, why are you crying about the lion? I don't get it. I'm like, it's Jesus. <laughs> but read Chronicles of Narnia. Read Randy Alcorn has tons of great fiction. Um, and he has this quote. I believe that God expects us to recognize the limits and flaws of our imaginations, but to utilize them nonetheless. Remembering always that though we're using our imaginations, heaven is more real than anything we've ever seen or touched. If God didn't want us to imagine what heaven will be like, he wouldn't have told us what he has. There will be a day that we can't even imagine where we are finally going to see God, where we are going to experience life without sin, life without brokenness, life with God that we were created to experience. It's a day we can only imagine, but Randy Alcorn imagines it. So I'm going to read this for us just to end on a note of encouraging us of this destination. A great roar rose from the vast crowd. The king raised his hands. Upon seeing those scars, the cheering crowds remembered the unthinkable cost of the great celebration. The multitudes innumerable began to sing the song for which they had been made, a song that echoed off of a trillion planets and reverberated in a quadrillion places in every nook and cranny of the creation symphony. One grand cantata of rhapsodic melodies and sustaining harmonies. All were participants. Only one was the audience. The audience of one. The smile of the king's approval swept through the choir like fire across dry wheat fields. When the song was complete, the audience of one stood and raised his great arms and clapped his hands together in thunderous applause, shaking ground and sky, jarring every corner of the cosmos. His applause went on and on, unstopping and unstoppable. Every one of them realized something with undiminished clarity in that instant. They wondered why they hadn't seen it all along. What they knew in that moment in every fiber of their beings was that this person and this place were all they had ever longed for and ever would. This is fiction. But from what scripture gives us, it's probably a really accurate way to think about what that day will be like. And that day may seem so distant right now. You may be so bogged down by the behaviors and the needs and the chores and all that faces you at home. But the reality is that that day is coming. And we can live with that day in mind, remembering these signs, finding hope for this race as we run, and remembering the destination. I am never more encouraged than when I think of the verse, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's what I want to live for. I know that I'm not always going to, that was such a beautiful story with a happy ending of a foster child finding redemption in Christ. But we may not always get to see the final part of the story. We may not always get all of that, and we have our questions, and we have so many things that weigh on us. But we can't live for the success stories. 
We can't live for the praise of man. We can't live for the happy ending. We have to live for this day, for this destination, and for one day hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to pray. I'm grateful for your attention. God, I thank you that everything we do has purpose, not just because we're caring for children that you created and loved, but because this is all about you and it all is eternal. God, give us vision in the mundane moments of cleaning up pee and having kids scream at us and dealing with lying workers and all the different things that we deal with. Help us, God, in those moments to remember that day. Help us to have hope in the moments when we think of that day and when we think of our eternal life with you. Please hope in our hearts now that carry us as we go home, when we come back to distractions, when we go back to struggles and trials and children and spouses. I thank you, God, that this can carry us because this is what you've given us to remind us of you and our lives with you forever. I thank you for this time. In Jesus' name. I finished nice and early for the night.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't tell you the method because I don't think it's right. Yeah, like, you know, we're trying to thank you. You know what? It's a 